Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Again, we're starting up the uh, Engine Boss Session 2. Uh, we're going to be asking our instructor, Brent Watson, uh, to take this session on. And again, for those viewers at home, you'll be able to watch this uh, session, uh, complete the online quiz, and then move on to Session 3. Uh, thank you for joining us, for those of you who are at home and to the class here today. We are practicing all the COVID-19 protocols, social distancing is in place, and um, yeah, thank you for your engagement and look forward to having you in the session. Brent. Thanks, Chief. Uh, I'm Brent Watson. I'm the Assistant Chief of Operations at West Colonial Fire. Um, I've also worked as a task force leader uh, with the OFC on deployment uh, going back to, I think, uh, 2016. So I've had a great privilege to, uh, to work with many in the room and work with the OFC and to really uh, contribute and, and build a program here that we're delivering today. Uh, just on that note, what, what, what this course is about and where it comes from is that it kind of comes from the need for structural firefighters to have a firm grounding in the wildland side of firefighting and also to utilize the skills that we use as structural firefighters to protect structures. Um, I was trained as a wildland firefighter way back in the early 90s. Um, went through 03, 09, uh, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, what goes on and on. Um, and Chad and I developed this course to actually address what we thought were gaps in, in concert with Chief Watkinson uh, in some of the training at the very lowest tactical levels of the structure uh, program. So um, I make absolutely no representations here that, that this material, this is material that we've taken from other sources through, through batteries running low. Uh, through decades of training, um, through a variety of courses, through generations of BC wildfire staff, we've benefited from that training greatly. So what we've tried to do is collate that, that information, kind of mix it in with experiences on deployment, mix it in with experiences as municipal firefighters in one of the busier interface intermixed communities in the province, and produce what we hope is a very inf informative course for you. I mentioned earlier, uh, I think during the break, that the initial concept of delivery for this course was going to be over a weekend uh, out in the bush, essentially, like literally. Uh, we had great plans to uh, talk to BC Parks and get a, a position in a park like in, in April or May, uh, set up our tents as we would in a task force sten, like set up, have marked, uh, have the routine laid out, uh, and deliver this using this book right here, the RPG, supplemented by our white board, <laughs> flip chart, talks. Then we're going to go out in the field, we're going to stretch lines, we're going to tactically move our apparatus in formation, engage, with, uh, disengage, and do that. And we still do that in day two of this course. It's just, it's a very different experience to go from kind of a tailboard out in the bush to a, a, a pretty uh, impressive production here. But uh, we hope that we can deliver a good program to you. Enough about me, my colleague uh, Chad, also from uh, West Kelowna. We team teach, we kind of have a, a style that we call the chant. But uh, <laughs> anyways, over to Chad for a sec. Yeah, hi everybody, Chad Gartrell, West Kelowna Fire Rescue. Um, I echo again uh, what Chief Watson said, or Brent said, uh, related to just being out there, um, seeing the gaps uh, where they were and, and trying to close those just to ensure the safety of everybody responding. A, in our own communities, um, you know, like Brent says, we, we host a, our fair share of our own um, events, uh, but then also when we're going out to areas that uh, we don't necessarily have uh, first-hand knowledge of the areas is, is just kind of building a framework where we can all show up together, all speak the same language, and all understand what we're actually trying to achieve while we're there uh, to meet the goals of, of sort of the structure uh, portion of, of BC Wildfighters, uh, BC Wildfires Greater Incident. So um, yeah, I'm just thankful to be here. Cool. Thanks, Chad. Um, so we're going to go through, we have uh, slide decks, as you can see, in the hard copies in your binders. Um, what you probably don't see, I haven't seen the actual latest version uh, as of today, uh, is that we have a selection of videos. Uh, we've chosen these videos uh, to illustrate some of the things we bring out, and they really try to capture what we're going after today, like the whole structural side in the, in the WUI. And I give full credit to a gentleman by the name of Rod Collins. He's a Reno firefighter, been in the business, I think, 43, 44 years. Uh, Chad and I did his training down at Reno, an uh, awesome individual, and we got a lot of the videos from him and, and the ideas for it. So full uh, acknowledgement to him. Okay, so like I said, uh, in the original concept of this course, this, is, this was going to be pretty much uh, your student handbook. So everybody has one of these, IRPG. They come out every couple of years, different colors. Okay, they update them occasionally. Um, have this handy. Uh, some of the slides refer to very specific um, uh, parts of this, this booklet. Um, 
you need this with you on day two. And I would advise that you leave it in your Nomex pants or your, your shirt pocket always. Because if you have downtime as an engine boss, you can thumb through this. I'll point out some of the key areas we're covering today. You can thumb through this and train your crew. Just go through things. It's part of that training, part of that safety awareness, continually evaluating your safety, your situational awareness. Um, it's an exceptional little booklet. Uh, some of the things that I, I want to draw your attention to, for example, like just the stuff you can find in here. Uh, if you look in the sort of the, I just started wearing glasses here. I think that's white. This part in the front of the book, uh, page XI talks about things like situational awareness. Safety is all about situational awareness for us, and you're going to hear a lot of this uh, shortly. Uh, keeping, you know, go forward, you can get into the greens, page one of the greens, the risk management process. You'll see this referenced on some of the slides. This is your checklist. If you find yourself absolutely, you're tired, you're confused, you're isolated, you're cut off, you're in a situation, this is your check go-to checklist to evaluate your situation. And follow through, it's a five-step checklist. If you can't answer the question to go on to the next one, you know that's a, that's a watch out. You gotta do something, you gotta move, you gotta go to a safety zone, you need to act decisively. Don't ignore it. It's a critical theme in this, this presentation. Jumping ahead, um, we'll get into like, you get into things like on page five of the green, common denomination of fire behavior on tragedy fires. We use a couple of case studies of tragedy fires. What those are, of course, are firefighting events, which have resulted in the loss of life of firefighters. Um, there's a lot to learn from these things. There's a website out there called the National Wildland uh, Lessons Learned Center that analyzes these things in details. They're a wealth of information. I encourage you, even in the off season, if you're a training officer in your department, to go over this stuff and you guys start working up to your, uh, your wildland uh, research, but it's just the great stuff. Um, and you can go through, it covers laces, it covers things like uh, fuel types, topography. Again, I'll just be going through this here and there, but uh, just have this handy and have it for the second day of the course. Any go there, Chad? Yeah, go ahead. Just so you guys know too, on, um, in your manuals, uh, we've also created a field guide for engine bosses, a larger scale of the IRPG, with the golden nuggets that we've taken out of there. The fuel types are on the last page, so if you're looking through the incident action plan and under trying to figure out what type of fuel types are referenced in that, you can see a picture that you can closely align that to. And it covers off the checklists and the safety guidelines, the 10s and 18s that are in that too, just at a, a larger scale. You can laminate that, make it your own, uh, take it for you in your own apparatus. I think a little bit for the, for as we get, you know, more experienced uh, members as our engine bosses is, as you gain more experience, your arms don't get any longer. So if you're starting to read stuff like this, it might be time to go and get a set of peepers so that you can read those little books if that's what you want to carry inside your pocket. Um, the other thing that we can do uh, prior to the season starting is actually, and I'm not sure if OFC is still offering this, but um, fire weather behavior. There's an S190 course that was hosted or, or was uh, put out for free before by the OFC. To have anyone that's going to be responding out uh, to be able to, to understand fire beha behavior when you're looking up into the skies, what are you seeing? Uh, it's, that's good sort of preseason work to continually review it every year before you start uh, getting into the wildfire season. Question over here? Are they still going to be offering that? It's a good question. The, the question was, yeah. are, are they still going to be offering the S190 course online for free? And no, the question is, uh, that is not accessible. Unless you do it through the National Wildfire Coordination Center, uh, you have to apply to have a FEMA uh, application. Uh, but what we've done is taken the S190 off the um, prerequisite for this course because the Wildland Firefighter 1 covers the basic fire behavior that we expect for the engine boss level. Oh. Uh, as you move into the task force leader and group soup leaders, that's where we actually require the S290. So um, this level is not a requirement. It certainly is good practice to pick up the S190, and we are looking at trying to create a fire behavior workshop for the wildfire symposium uh, possibly next spring. Good question. Okay, so like I said, this presentation is on safety, and like Kim said earlier this morning, uh, if we don't have safety, there's nothing else going on because that everything stops there. If we can't achieve safety, then nothing else, it all stops there, period, full stop. That, that's it, okay? We withdraw, we reformulate a plan, whatever it is, that is it. Safety is par absolutely paramount. So, like I said, this course tries to cover some pretty kind of wildlandish type scenarios and some very urban interface type scenarios. 
And you see these two photos here. Everybody knows the difference between the interface, where we have that hard boundary between development uh, and the surrounding forests. And then, of course, the intermix, uh, rural properties, usually larger parcels, sometimes you know, like animals, that sort of thing, ranches uh, that are in the middle of the forest, so islands of kind of development within the forest itself. So obviously, this is what we're trying to avoid at all costs. OK, so one of the things that I've seen uh, in the last like four years of, of, of deploying out, uh, and I've seen it in my own, uh, my own uh, response area as well, is that when I started my career, it was pretty common for structural firefighters to be internal gear, usually not with a coat on, but the jacket and, and the pants and the boots, stretching lines out like way into the black. Like, say this is along a the road, they're stretching like inch and a half lines, pre-connects out there, and they're actually in a stump that's smoldering somewhere out there. Just what's the thing we did, right? We don't do that, okay? And that's something that we've seen. Uh, Kim mentioned how we've changed, like how the program is really evolved over the years. And I'm speaking just for structure here. Uh, in the last few years, uh, we've really seen less tendency to do that. Like, and again, it goes back to leaders' intent, which we talked about earlier. Why are you there, as a structural firefighter? Are you there to dig up stunk, cold trail it for a couple of days? Or are you there to protect houses, cr critical infrastructure, values at risk? Okay. Again, if you find yourself in that situation as an engine boss, and you're not sure, like, hey, there, you know, a civilian goes by, hey, there's a stump on fire over there, a tree over, on fire. As an engine boss, go back to that leader's intent, that whole safety piece. We don't work out there, okay? That stump's not gonna go anywhere. It's in the black, okay? A 20-pack crew could go in there and dig it up or whatever the, in a few days, but that is not our primary concern. Our concern is structures and their protection. So we do not work in the forest. We are not forest firefighters. That's not to say we don't encounter those conditions, though, and you'll see through this presentation that we do, but we don't, by you know, definition, work in the forest. We do work here. Um, some examples uh, from recent deployments over the years. I think that was Lillouette Chief, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, Christy Mountain uh, this past summer, and then Christy Mountain, that was about, I don't know, probably four or five hours before this. This is lower down the hill. Um, I hope everybody can see that. Uh, we'll talk about this more in the tactical phase of, of, of today's course. But you can see this fire was up here. You can see how we have engines in a prep and defend situation. Remember that term, prep and defend, a tactic we'll talk about later. Uh, they're backed in, oriented with their escape routes out, and they're providing structure protection uh, to about a rank one, two fire uh, in behind uh, those houses. Uh, tenders are providing water support, task force leaders there, um, and that was that operation. So again, this is what we do. Okay, so some basic interface intermix operating principles. Again, safety is priority number one. Okay, defending houses, property, critical infrastructure is secondary. And it'll take action only when it's safe to do so. Okay, so again, we're gonna go through a, different, a couple of different formats, sort of decision-making tools, when we actually engage to protect structures and when it's safe to do so. So structures are just another type of fuel. And that's one thing that the Canadian Forest Fire uh, Danger uh, Rating Index, it doesn't always take that into account. So some of you guys have done like CWPPs, you heard of that? Uh, and they actually have fire behavior and, and fire spread maps and projections. It doesn't always take the structures as fuel into account. So that's important because when you get a fire, when it goes into the interface, it's a very different fire, right? Because what, what is your primary fuel in an interface fire when it actually gets into it? Is it trees or is it houses? Okay, so it's houses. So again, you have to consider these as just another type of fuel and not worth risking your life for. We don't compromise safety to meet tactical objectives. Okay, we keep hammering it over and over on this. What does that mean? It means that we don't, if you're given a task and you can't do it safely, you don't do it. And again, that's not just a, that is a constant factor. It could change throughout the day. Okay, what, what a fire's doing at, at nine o'clock in the morning, is it the same as what it's doing at 1600, potentially? So you have to constantly evaluate your tactical conditions. If it's not safe to do so, then don't do it. And there's that expression, uh, learn to leave and leave, uh, leave to live. Uh, that's, this here is the fire that we lost at Christie Mountain uh, this past summer, the house. 